Hey everybody, how's it going? So today I was writing in my journal and I realized that this is about the 12 year anniversary of me quitting one of the dumps that I worked for back then. So I kind of wanted to talk about it a little bit because it was a fun, it's a, it was a, it's a fun memory for me that, uh, I'll be honest, you know, for all the adventures that I've had over the past 12 or 13 years in business, the the most fun is the first year that you go out on your own and you're completely uncertain as to how things are going to go. So I'm not going to say the name of it. The people that I know closely know what place I'm talking about. But I had gotten a job at this one repair shop nearby, and it was horrible. I spent four days there. I remember needing a soldering iron to do a job. They had some $9 Radio Shack piece of shit, and when the tip was completely destroyed, they gave me sandpaper rather than letting me, you know, get a decent iron. They had this, they did this thing with AdWords where they were paying so much for the customers to come in that every single customer that came in, they needed to make money off of you because of how much they paid to get you in the door. So they would do this thing where if you had a bad charger, they'd tell you that you had a bad charge port, it would be 150 bucks to change the charge port, but because we're so nice, here's the thing. We think your charger may have killed the charge port. We'll give you a new charger on the house. And they go, oh, thank you so much, blah, blah, blah. And they pretend that they, you know, it was a horrible place. And there was this one day where I was working on something and there was this one guy there who was an asshole who was standing over my shoulder looking at everything I was doing. He bumped into my chair. I ripped a Wi-Fi antenna and I just said, all right, I'm done with this shit. You know, I, I, I brought the machine into the, who are you? What do you want, you fuck? Hello. I have a topic for you. Amazon delivery. Amazon delivery. Oh, I'll be right down. Thank you. Amazon delivery, delivery, Erica. Did you order something? I did not order anything. (laughs) It's going to be an axe murderer. You realize that that's an axe murderer, right? Which I'd almost prefer at this point to my car's extended warranty. Anyway, so... (laughs) I, I wound up just, you know, going into the office and saying I'm done. And they said, well, do you, you know, at least come by on Friday so that you could pick up what you what we owe you. They would pay you $40 for each repair that you completed, whether it was a Windows reinstall or a component level board repair. You got 40 bucks for anything that you did. And uh, I said, no, I'm just, not. I, I honestly, I don't even want to step foot in this building again. I'm so disgusted uh, over the past week. And uh, the, the one of the other memorable occasions was when a customer put on the form, they were willing to spend 250 bucks to fix an A1181. I actually managed to fix it at a component level. And I don't know what the hell I was doing back then. I just like, I saw burnt, I flicked burn off the board at work. We're good. Uh, it, you know, I wasn't, exa- I wasn't a, a, a really a good technician back then. And I, I fixed it. But since the board repair there was 350 and the person only approved 250 even though it was already done, I had to break the device and give it back to the customer. Like when stuff like that happens here, if we fix something and it wasn't approved and, you know, like I'm, I don't break it again unless this is someone that has genuinely cursed out my staff and everything like that. So I, I decided to, you know, screw this. I, could, I didn't have another job lined up. I was broke at the time. I barely had any money, but I figured there's, there's no way that I could do If these people are able to pay their rent, and I asked the other people there, do you get paid a salary or are they behind? Like, no, they, they always pay on time. If this place can afford to pay their staff on time, there's no way in hell I can do worse than this. There's really no way I can do worse than this. So I decided to put my money where my mouth is, and I got started. And this was 2009. This is right after the, you know, the 2008 recession, stock market crashing, all the jobs going away and all that. And I was worried about my prospects for the future. But one of the things that, that helped me uh, was that fact that if you look at car purchases, you'll see that car purchases really kind of crashed at that time. So I imagine if you were a mechanic, you may have had an up in business. And the same kind of thing happened with my industry. Whereas other people would have said, you know, it's only one or $300 more to buy a new one than fix it. I'll buy a new one. Now they were saying, ah, oh, it's two or 300 more to buy a new one than fix it. I guess I'll fix it. And I wound up starting this business. Now, this this was kind of a joke at the time. I had my uh, a garbage website that I advertised on Backpage, Craigslist, Kijiji, OLX, and classifiedads.com. I was using Herald Square Park for my, my office, and I was meeting customers there. And one of the reasons that I mention this is because I've been getting a few comments on this uh, one comment someone left a while back asking, you know, what do I, I work for a place that I don't respect. They do all these other things wrong. What should I do? And my first comment was quit. 
And then he said, well, I don't have something else lined up. And one of the things that I love about the repair business in general is the this has one of the lowest barriers to entry of virtually any field that there is. This is not like starting a restaurant where you're going to need fifty or $100,000 of stuff and all these permits and inspections. This is not like, you know, you work at Intel and you don't like some of their practices. Go start your own chip fabricator or manufacturer. Like, you know, it, that stuff you can't really do. You know, I don't like the way this hospital does business. Start your own hospital. One of the great things about this industry and one of the reasons I feel so uh, passionate about ensuring that it stays around is it is an industry that has an incredibly low barrier to entry. Now, I have a lot of fancy schmancy tools in my office. You may not have all the fancy schmancy stuff I do, but at the end of the day, that there's only an incremental level of improvement having the fancy schmancy stuff over the cheap shit. And if you have the cheap shit, it may just mean that there are a couple of repairs you may have to say no to or refer out to someone else in the beginning, but who cares? At least you get started. At least you get started doing something. And one of the things that I really do feel strongly about, at least for my particular field, and that's very important, is if you don't like the place that you are working, if you think that they mistreat you, if they think that they are horrible to you, uh, by all means quit. Do not continue to put your time and effort into a job in the repair industry where you believe that they treat the customers unfairly or where they treat you unfairly. It is simply too easy to start your own business in this field, to start soliciting your own clients in this field, if you are willing to put in the time and the effort to stay at a place that sucks. With many other businesses, there's this idea that you need $50,000 or $150,000 or a diploma or millions of dollars to set up and capitalize. So you, you, you have an excuse in a lot of other businesses to not do that. But th th in my opinion, this simply doesn't exist in the repair industry. Again, if you're trying to, you know, if, if you're trying to become like an asset genie level business or something, yeah, you're not going to do that on your own. But you could absolutely start a business that allows you to service customers in the similar manner that the business that you work at services customers if you're willing to put in the time and the effort. And one of the things that I find is that when I speak to people who are in these positions, it always comes down to the same thing, almost all the time. Eh, I don't want to be the one that talks to the customer. Eh, I don't want to have to do advertising. Or I don't want to set up. It always comes down to that. So you know, this is the thing that really pisses me off. So you're willing to work for a business that screws over the customer. You're more than willing to work at a company that openly says we are going to charge the customer for a charge port when the only problem with their machine is a charger solely because we, we need to pay for that for our $12,000 a month in Ad AdWords budget. You're willing to do that You rather than have to do some of your own legwork, some of your own advertising, or dare I say it, deal with a customer. And this is the part that I've always found particularly ironic. When people reach out to me and say, the place I work at is screwing people over, and blah, what should I do? And I say, quit, start your own company. And they say, yeah, I just don't want to deal with the customers. I find this to be incredible. So sometimes people will complain and they'll say, this repair shop is screwing people over. I don't want to work at it anymore. You're complaining about the quality of the customer service, but then you're not actually willing to do customer service. There's this idea in the repair industry that, you know, like, I would love it if not for the customers. And don't get me wrong. I have, I've been in this business 13 years. I've had my full share in, in Manhattan and New York City of crazy customers, unreasonable customers, douchebag customers, people that will leave one-star Yelp reviews bragging about how they, they work management at multi-million dollar corporations where I have to politely point out to them, or maybe less than politely, that you know your underlings probably think you're a piece of shit. It's just that I'm in the position to tell you <laughs> that you're acting like a fucking douchebag, and etc. I assure you that, but there's also a lot of really good customers that we're it genuinely is enjoyable to be able to describe what we do and have a good experience and provide them what they're looking for. But the point there is, I find it so incredibly ridiculous that people will say, I don't, the place that I work at screws people, but I don't want to quit because then I would actually have to deal with people. You, you know, you're complaining about how they deal with people, but you don't want to do better. And, you know, it always comes, always, always comes down to that. I don't want to have to deal with customers on my own. And if that's the case, then you're never going to move on. You're never going to, to, to have that opportunity. For me, it was an easy trade-off. Yes, I'd have to deal with my own customers. I'd have to do my own advertising. I would have to be my own, you know, my own inventory manager and so on. But, but it was worth it to me to put my money where my mouth is. I said, I, I, I could probably run a place better than this. Let's see if I actually can. And then I wound up running a place better than that. And then I stole two of their employees that hated the, the way the place was run. And one of them actually still works here today, eight years after I hired him. And he's, he's, a, he's a genuinely great guy. If you work in this industry, there's boundless opportunity to make money off of a very small initial investment. And I think that that has to be remembered. You don't have to set up a fancy store. You don't have to pay $12,000 a month 
in AdWords. There's, there's a lot of opportunity out there, and you're going to be able to offer certain types of personalized service that a larger store is not going to be able to offer because they have too much on their hands. So there are certain custom services that I just don't offer for customers because the pain in the ass it would be to deal with that within my regular workflow of the amount of machines that I have to get in and out every single day to pay the staff and to pay the rent. It's just not something that, that is efficient. Whereas if you're only dealing with one or two customers a day and you're on your own as an independent consultant, not only can you do stuff that larger stores may not really be fit or equipped to do or you know give them that extra level of personalized service, but you're, you may also be able to offer a cheaper price because you're just working out of your apartment and you're a one-man band. There's a lot of opportunity in this business. And if, you, if you're working for a business that you find to be immoral or that you think treats people badly, in this business, in the independent third-party repair business, in my opinion, there's virtually no excuse to not try, at least try and go out on your own, you know, solicit some jobs on the weekend, you know, you know, put your toe in the water, try to feel out what it's like to run your own business. Because if you're not willing to do that, then at some point you're going to have to stop complaining about how horrible the place that you work at is. Because again, this is one of those businesses where you really can have $268 in your pocket and create an empire out of it. it. It genuinely is possible. This is how many of the businesses that are radically more successful than mine, way more successful than mine, where the owners have gone away with millions and millions of dollars after selling their business to all state or insurance companies, have started really in their, their dorm room with you know, a few hundred bucks. And it's, it's just something that I think people should consider and think about when they're looking at, uh, at starting their own thing in this field. Now, I know that these are hard times. I know because of COVID, it's very difficult to find another job. And one of the things that I think is worth pointing out here is that there is actually an opportunity for people who are new and starting out who don't have expenses to be able to compete with existing shops as a result of what's going on. So one of the things I mentioned prior was that when there is a recession, you'll see that spending on certain items goes down. So when, you know, after 2008, 2009, you'll see for a few years that, uh, that people buying more expensive cars went downhill. And that is probably something that you're going to see happen when it comes to how people make decisions about buying new expensive consumer hardware as well. It's why a business like this one was able to start in 2009 and actually do really well. People get this a little misconstrued. It's actually better to start a business at the start of a recession than it is to start a business at the peak of the, uh, of the, of the bull run because you're going to be making better decisions, but also there's going to be certain levels of opportunity there, particularly when it comes to the repair industry and people deciding that they would rather fix than, uh, than, than buy a new one for financial reasons. Also, for your existing employer, let's say that you work for a dumbass that decided to triple their expenses and move to a much larger location, right as uh, you know, a bunch of the population decided to move out of the state because of, because of COVID. You're going to be in a better position than your employer if they are in the position that they are in based on the market conditions of a bull run once you're at the uh, the recession or depression tail end of it, particularly if you're starting off and have no expenses. You're going to be in a position to structure your business around the reality of today, whereas your employer may have structured their finances of their business around the financial reality of last year. So just something to think about. Also, admittedly, this is one of the few good things that comes out of living in a place like New York City. Uh, I crap on New York City a lot for, in my opinion, a lot of good reasons. Anybody who watched my real estate series can just see that uh, that that the lying false advertising scummy behavior places that are in horrible just states of disrepair no pride taken in place in the the condition of the uh, buildings that people own that that's that seems to be the norm here so this is one of the cities where if you wanted to put in 12 to 14 hours a day of work that 12 to 14 hours a day of work is actually here I know people that work in repair places that they don't particularly like in their smaller towns and the opportunity may not be there if they start putting up ads, if they start posting on websites, if they start, you know, going to their local pizza place and coffee place and all that and handing out business cards and posting stuff on bulletin boards, there's not going to be that level of work there for them. One thing I appreciate about New York City and think is amazing is that regardless of what a cesspool the city is, if you have an idea and you have a service that you want to offer that there is demand for in the marketplace, there is a way to make money here. You may not be able to live exactly as nicely as you as you want. You may be hustling a little bit. You may be working you know, long hours. But if you have an idea 
and there is demand for a particular product or service, and you're good at providing that product or service, you will be able to here. There are a lot of areas in the U.S. that are great areas. I'd love to live there. The people are nicer. The housing is cheaper. The government is saner. Everything else is better. But because the town only has 8,000 or 10,000 people in it, if you have that idea, you could be great at providing the service, but there may simply not be the demand there to compete with someone who exists. Whereas when you have 8 million people in the space the size of Knoxville, Tennessee, you then have a um, you you then have the ability to go out on your own and offer something that is better than what was being offered by your prior employer. And I think that this also is something, it's, it's a mechanism that keeps people honest. So I have to be able to offer to the people that work here a salary and a, a level of treatment that is decent enough that they don't feel like going out on their own. That's one of the good things about there being a low barrier to entry in this business. If I mistreat someone, it's again, it's not like a hospital or Intel or something, like, you know, go start your own processor manufacturer, go start your own hospital where it takes billions of t dollars to do that. It's something where if I mistreat someone, they can easily start their own business. So there are people here that may think that they can make more on their own, but they may not be able to because they're missing this, that, or the other skill. If they do have all those skills, I'll pay them a certain amount where, where the whole idea is you'd be better off working here than going out on your own. And if I don't pay them enough that they're better off working here than going out on their own and doing all that work, then they they will go out off on their own. What keeps the system working and a nice, well-regulated oil machine for the entire industry is when people are willing to leave if they are being mistreated, at the very least if they're in an area with a decent population density where you the, the work is out there. And on a, the reason I'm really doing this video is I'm just sick and tired of hearing this whole in my employer sucks. They're immoral. They're this. They don't pay this. They don't pay that. And the only reason that someone may not want to go out on their own is that they don't want to deal with the end customer. When people say my employer treats me so badly and they screw everybody over and this, that, and the other, and I'm worth so much more money. And then I say, well, you could offer these services based on your skill set and probably make more money. And they go, yeah, but then I'd have to deal with a customer. And they say, I don't want to do that. You're not worth what you think that you're worth. If you're unwilling to speak to the person who is responsible for paying your salary and ensure that they are happy, whatever amount of money you think you're worth, you're not. So get over this holier than thou, I don't speak to customers bullshit mindset. Understand that they're the people paying you. And if you're willing to deal with that customer, if you're willing to actually speak with them like they're a human being, then the, the possibilities for you are endless. But you need to get over that to be willing to start in this business. I remember back in 2009, like, not going to say I'm the most proud of this, but I remember going and buying a blue polo shirt, going to the Apple store on 14th and 9th, walking up to people who look pissed and going, what can I do for you? And at the end of my conversation, I would usually say, okay, cool. I don't work here, but here's my card. Here's what it would cost to help you out. I was shameless with it. I was willing to deal with people in that way. And you, you know, honestly, looking back at it 13, 12 years ago, I would much rather have dealt with doing that to get where I am now then work at that place that was scamming people left and right, treating people like shit, giving me sandpaper to use in a soldering iron because they were too fucking cheap to spend $15 on a new tip. Anyway, just, uh, just a bit of a rant there. Really do take advantage of the opportunities in this industry because they are there. And at, at some point, even if your employer is a scumbag, you, you got to start really being honest with yourself about why you're there instead of, instead of moving on. See you later. See you in the next video. Um, that's about it. So the line should not be underneath your foot, dude. What? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even do anything. <laughs> He's like, she, she's going. Like she bought GameStop at 350. No, it's like, it's like I was like looking at the line. All of a sudden, it just accelerates like that. Oh, pothole. This actually handled that pothole pretty nicely. Uh, yeah. Oh, look at that other pothole. Oh. It's not my car. Let's see how. This is a great way to figure out how the suspension handles power. Look at that guy, he's going over the line too. Ah, what are you doing? Don't go over the line. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that wasn't me. That's You see why I slowed down there though? Because I saw what he was yeah, up to. Yeah, why do you have such shitty drivers in New York? Do you guys all pay off your, uh, your road? We get to learn how to drive in six hours, Erica. Six hours and they let you loose on the world. And, and, you, won and you wonder why I don't feel comfortable driving in New York. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, this is so... Look at, look at the... Look at the... What is this shitty ass patchwork? <laughs> Look at that! Oh my gosh, it's so bumpy. Well, we get to see how the car's hand suspension handles it. Because Paul said that yeah, you can't get a car with a shitty suspension. That's why he said don't get a Mercedes or a BMW if you need it to last more than three years. 
Oh! What the fuck? I had to do that to you, I'm sorry. I just was testing a feature is all. Testing a feature? What? Oh my gosh! Fuck! Okay, that, that, that's crazy. Oh! <laughs> you would think for as, as pretty as these cars in, you could have made some premium seats, like some very comfortable, comfortable seats. They can't even give you a speedometer. Erica, look at the speedometer. You have a speedometer? Yeah, well, see, see? Look at my HUD. Look no, at... you got a speedometer right here. That doesn't screen. count. You have to look down into the right. That's bullshit. You should never have to look down into the right in a fucking vehicle. Yeah, but you, you, you can... Look... Huh? 